And now, without further ado, it's my honor and privilege to in introduce our featured speaker. Bangalore-based historian Dr. Vikram Sampath is the author of eight acclaimed books. His two-volume biography, Savarkar, Echoes from, the, from a Forgotten Past, and Savarkar, A Contested Legacy, went on to become national bestsellers and were acclaimed by Indian Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi. In 2021, Dr. Sampath was conferred the honor of being elected as a fellow of UK's prestigious Royal Historical Society. He was awarded the Sahitya Academy's first Yuva Purushkar in English Literature and the ARSC International Award for Excellence in Historical Research in New York for his book on Gohar Jan. The book has also been adapted to theater as a play, Gohar, by Lilette Dubey, and is being adapted to a Bollywood film by Ashutosh Gwarkar. Dr. Sampath was among the four writers and artists to be selected as a writer in residence at the Rashtrapati Bhavan in 2015. He has a doctor in history and music from the University of Queensland, Australia, and was a senior research fellow at the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library in New Delhi. He is also an Aspen Global Leadership Fellow and an Eisenhower Global Fellow 2021, and is an adjunct senior research fellow at the Monash University, Australia, an engineer mathematician from BITS Bilani, and an MBA in finance from SP, Ch SP Jain, Mumbai. Dr. Sampath is also a trained Carnatic vocalist he has established the Archive of Indian Music, India's first digital sound archive for vintage recordings, is a founder director of the Bangalore Literature Festival, Indic Thoughts Festival, and Earth, a culture fest. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Sampath. Thank you, Samitji. Namaste and namaste to all your listeners. Uh, I think it's, a, it's always such a pleasure to participate in anything that HAF does. And um, my support and, and uh, appreciation for HAF's activities and that of Suhagji and Asimji and all of you uh, who are such dear friends. Great. Thank you so much for the kind words. Uh, before we dive in, I would be remiss for not um, asking you a little bit about your fascinating journey and background to where you are today. Um, just looking at your bio and reading it again, engineering and mathematics background, an MBA, uh, Carnatic vocalist, and now historian and author. I think by far, you must be the most interesting man in the world. Um, but but uh, tell me a little bit how you got to the place you are today and um, what what took you on that path to becoming a historian and author now? <laughs> well, I think I often joke that confusion rules my CV. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the history and music both, you know, were childhood friends for me, right, from a very young age that I was... Uh, I was a single child and so uh, quite lonely otherwise. And so books and music were my constant companions. And my whole fascination with history began when I was all of 12 or 13. Uh, there was a serial on Indian television those days called The Sword of Tipu Sultan. And in which, uh, you know, the, the Mysore royal family, the Hindu royal family of Mysore was shown in a very, very poor light just to amplify the greatness of Tipu and his father, Haider Ali, who were actually usurpers of the Hindu throne. And they were, uh, there was mass protests in different parts of, um, you know, southern Karnataka, where I, I come from. And, you know, as a, as a uh, schoolboy who otherwise hated the way history was taught in school, uh, you know, the, the very dull rote learning that we are subjected to of learning dates and wars and succession and who succeeded whom and all of that. Uh, this was something that just kindled my child, uh, childish curiosity that what is the truth? behind this false representation and from there on began a long self-inspired and more importantly self-funded uh, you know journey of uh, trying to find the truth about just that one uh, ruler of the Mysore family who was misrepresented and that slowly expanded to an interest in uh, uh, the entire dynasty of the Wadiyars of Mysore who were one of the longest reigning royal houses of India for a uh, reigning for about 600 years. And unfortunately, there was not even a single book written on them uh, from a modern perspective post-independence. And so as Tony Morrison had said, if there's a book that you want to read and it's not been written yet, you must be the first one to write it. <laughs> and so that's what led me very serendipitously uh, into uh, actually becoming a published author in the field and discipline that I so loved till then, uh, history. Of course, that began as an amateurish uh, attempt. And later on, I equipped my 
myself with the tools of historical research with a formal degree uh, and a PhD to uh, equip me with research methodologies and techniques. And the rest, as they say, is history. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'm glad you found the uh, the journey that you did because you've written a number of excellent books, um, two of which we're going to discuss a little bit briefly. Um, but let's go ahead and dive right in. And let's start at a very basic level. Uh, you know, we constantly hear the term Hindutva, um, how it's used in different contexts, some positive, some negative. Uh, for those that are not familiar with the term, as many in the audience may not be, uh, what would you define as Hindutva, as the term or ideology? Um, Samiji, that's a very interesting question to begin with. Let's uh, dive a little you know, uh, deeper, much ahead of the Hindutva term, let's go to the term Hindu itself. Uh, you know, the, the word Hindu, uh, it was not always used uh, with religious connotations. Uh, it was an ethnogeographical and a cultural term that 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 was in vogue all the time. Uh, one of the earliest, uh, you know, occurrences of this is the Achaemenid Empire's Persian king, uh, Darius the Great's inscriptions, who talks of uh, this land called uh, Hindush or he into the people of that uh, place, which broadly, uh, you know, geographical terms for people who lived beyond the river Indus or the Sindhu Nadi, which uh, when corrupted in Arab, um, uh, Arabic became uh, Hindu. And so even in the 18th, 8th century text, uh, Chachnama, the people of India were referred to as Hindu one and Hindavi. Uh, and even when we have the Chinese uh, Buddhist scholar, Yuan Sang, who came to India in the 7th century, he also talks of uh, the people here and the country here as into. Uh, likewise, you have Arabic references right from the 8th to the uh, 11th and 12th century, which talks of this geographical mass uh, of land, which is called Al-Hind. So as I said, all these um, you know, historical references point to geographical uh, terminology for, for a group of people, irrespective of what faith they followed, all of the, uh, whom lived beyond this river. Uh, and it was not, religion was not the marker there. The term Hinduism itself was a much later construct, uh, probably of the 1830s. Uh, you know, when the British, uh, you know, uh, decided to club anybody who was not a Muslim, a Christian, a Parsi, etc. All of them clubbed under this vast group of Hinduism. Uh, and actually, when, uh, you know, when you see the, the, the use of this terminology of words which are suffixed with an ism, you often use it uh, with a derogatory sense. You know, when you want to also club a group of uh, similar sounding things and deny that group of any essence of plurality. So have, we've never wondered why it's not Islamism or Christianism, uh, right? But then all other Oriental religions, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and also, uh, uh, you know, um, the theologies which are, which go, which went beyond the mainstream, Marxism or socialism, anything that had to be uh, inferiorized were all clubbed under an ism. And so that's how Hinduism came up uh, in the 1830s because, but traditionally in Bharat, in India, it was always a Sanatan Dharma. We, we did not describe it as a codified religion. Uh, Sanatan Dharma is an eternal flow, uh, like a river which keeps flowing and it draws in multiple tributaries, uh, differing viewpoints. And so that's why every opposing viewpoint uh, could also be assimilated into this vast ocean of the Sanatan Dharma. And Dharma here uh, is not to be used in the religion uh, context. Religion is an institution, whereas dharma is, um, I would say, it's an ideal. It's something that you strive to be right. Uh, and often probably dharma asks you to reject institutions which show you the wrong path. Uh, so this fundamental difference of how the East looks at faiths, at religions, was completely missed out by the colonial masters, uh, the British. And so they decided to club all of this under this rubric of Hinduism, as I said, in the 1830s. But curiously, about six decades later, it was in 1892 that we find the first historical uh, you know, occurrence of the word Hindutva. And that comes about in a Bengali uh, you know, novel uh, work written by the scholar called Chandranath Basu, uh, who wrote his book called Hindutva, an authentic history of the Hindus, of course, the original being in Bengali. Now, uh, what was this word then Hindutva? Now, if you look at this Tva, the suffix that is added in Sanskrit and you know several Indian languages, 
it refers to a state of being uh, or the essence, right? If you are a man, a purush, purushatva, the manliness, nari, naritva, fem, femininity. Uh, so similarly, the, the essence of being a Hindu, which again, as I mentioned, was not completely religious in its connotation, but also uh, ethno-geographic uh, identity of the people who lived in this part of the world, that um, essence of being or the state of being came to be known as Hindutva in local, uh, you know, Indian parlance. So etymologically speaking, Hinduism and Hindutva are not different. It is one and the same. Hinduism clubs all of these practices, multiple, you know, uh, belief systems which exist, schools of philosophy which exist within Sanatan Dharma into this fold called Hinduism, whereas Hindutva makes it into some kind of a uh, you know, it, it gives that essence to what it is to be Hindu. So that was exactly how Hindutva could be defined per se. But then this definition changed and, you know, uh, metamorphosed with the times and also re reacting to the historical events that were occurring, particularly in the early 20th century. Uh, you find a gradual evolution of this in the works, in the writings of, uh, you know, Swami Dayanand Saraswati, Swami Vivekananda, Maharshi Aurobindo, uh, Bal Gangadhar Tilak, and ultimately the person who is today credited, uh, though wrongly, with coining the term um, of Hindutva, which is Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. Uh, you know, though, as I mentioned, there was a long history of people who had spoken about this even before Savarkar burst on this uh, scene in 1923, uh, defining this term of what uh, Hindutva is. Now, uh, in, in such a context, I think we need to know this entire history of uh, this term, Hindutva, and this political Hindutva that came about during this time, uh, adding to the esoteric, the philosophical, the theological, this was also a very essential uh, requirement of the times where it was conceptualized as a bulwark against political Islam, uh, and the activities of missionaries and so on. Uh, and that's how it slowly evolved uh, as to how could Hindus uh, actually put up a resistance against predatory forces. Now, all of us know, uh, you know, Hindu philosophy is full replete with a lot of lofty principles of Ekam Sat Vipraha Bahuda Vadanti. Uh, you know, there's just one truth, but the wise men call it by different names. Vasudhaiva Kutumbakam, the world is a universe and all of that. Uh, but these, what does, what happens when an egalitarian philosophy like this comes head on in clash historically over several centuries uh, with theologies which do not, uh, you know, recognize this embraceiveness, which talk of my way or the highway, that there is only one road to, uh, to salvation, that there is only one truth, there is only one book, one messenger, one uh, way of life, and anybody who doesn't subscribe to that is, uh, is a heathen, is a non-believer, is an infidel, uh, and they need to be uh, crushed, and it becomes the legitimate duty of the believer to actually engage in crushing the false religion of uh, the pagans. So what happens when such a evolved, um, you know, tolerant, embraceive, inclusive philosophy comes head on in clash in political, military terms, in cultural terms over centuries of India's history? Uh, there is obviously a, a huge uh, rupture. And that's what we've seen in Indian history, as American uh, historian Will Durant had said, the Islamic conquest of India is one of the bloodiest uh, stories, not just of Indian history, but of human history. So the long centuries of Hindu genocide that we saw because of that, uh, culminating by the 20th century into forces of secessionism, where on the basis of religion, there were demands for separate nation states, uh, special benefits, be it electoral, uh, you know, uh, benefits, separate electoral uh, seats, reservations, and all of that. Uh, in such a scenario, what does this other religion do, uh, which is so inclusive and embraceive? It, if it just sits quiet, it is going to be subsumed by these predatory forces, which are on constantly and theologically, they have been ordained to suppress uh, the, the other religion. So do does the other religion just sit quietly and take all of this, or should it stand up and defend what is rightfully its? Uh, so legitimate resistance against uh, predatory forces, and that's how Hindutva 
um, which was used initially as this term of being an essence of being a Hindu, metamorphosed into something more political. And when we use the word political, it need not be pejoratively. It is uh, with the sense that you know, you're standing up for your rights, for your legitimate resistance, and for your survival uh, in the wake of a lot of other factors and forces which are trying to subsume you. So in short, to your short question, the long <laughs> answer has been that this, uh, according to me, is the journey, all these terms which are very important uh, to understand what is the term Hindu mean, what is Hinduism, and how is it different actually from Hindutva or are they the same? Etymologically, they are the same. But Hindutva has this additional component added as a requirement of the times, early 20th century, and probably today all the more German, considering we are probably the only nation uh, with so many, uh, with Hindus as a majority uh, in India. And in such a uh, scenario, and the diaspora uh, in different uh, parts of the world, which probably less than one or 2% of the population, how do they survive uh, in the midst of a lot of uh, attacks, racism, and all of that that goes around. So in that context is how I would define and uh, subscribe to Hindutva uh, as a, the definition of it. And I think that's very important context to lay out is number one, Hinduism and the misunderstandings of what Hinduism even means or the Hindu term itself, and then Hindutva, of course. Now, you talked uh, just a follow up question there. You talked a little bit about some of the intellectual and uh, other leaders at the time that helped contribute to its development, evolution. What did the common Indian view Hindutva as at that time? Was there a consciousness of the term or the concept? Um, or was it something that was more at an intellectual level amongst the leadership of, um, you know, the Indian Indian society at the time? I think it it was evolving, Samirji, because, uh, you know, when you look at even the uh, census documents of the British, right, from the late 19th century, uh, most, you know, um, uh, Hindus would not enumerate themselves as Hindus. Uh, they would enumerate themselves by the numerous subsects that uh, they believed in. So it would be Sanatanis, it would be Arya Samajis, Brahmo Samajis, uh, Lingayats, and all uh, so many other you know thousands of sects that we have. Uh, but no common term uh, to uh, to to say that they subscribe to a larger philosophy. There may be different schools of thought within that, uh, which has been there right from beginning. Whether it's a uh, Shaivite, Vaishnavite, Shakta, the Tantric school, the Vedic school. So these have been multiple um, you know philosophical strands within this larger rubric. But one common thread that binds all of them being Hindu. That enumeration was not done almost uh, uh, till the early decades of the 20th century. And that is where the work of people like, uh, you know, the Arya Samaj and later the Hindu Mahasabha and uh, Savarkar and others to say that, you know, while on the other side, uh, the Muslims were not enumerating themselves as Barelvis and Diobandis or Shias and Sunnis. Mm -hmm. They were uh, categorizing themselves as one common block uh, and thereby and, it, and in British India, everything was a game of numbers. So if you had the numbers, you, you um, got uh, you know, proportionate representation in the legislatures and assemblies and parliament and so on, uh, with whatever little democracy was there uh, under the British Raj. Uh, so even that would be something that the Hindus would be uh, stripped of. And so to, to get the, those benefits of at least your numbers, your, your numerical strength, uh, there was a need to consolidate. Um, and that was one driver, which is not a bad thing. Many people hold that against uh, the forces of Hindutva, saying it was only for political considerations. Yes, political considerations and survival uh, within that is a very important element of any human society, uh, especially at a time when, as I said, numbers mattered so much. Uh, and uh, depending on your numerical strength, not only were you getting representation, but you were also your power of negotiation with the Viceroy or the British uh, Lords uh, actually was determined by uh, how much strength you brought to the table. So to this extent, I think the, 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 the awareness uh, about this term and that we belong to this rather than the different uh, you know, subsects and the punts that uh, people belong to, that came in much later. And over a protracted period of time, this awareness was generated that you, know, you may be what you are. You can have your identity as 
uh, a Vaishnavite or a Sanatani or an Arya Samaji, but your larger identity is that of a Hindu. So in terms of Hindutva, since that pre-independence, pre-partition period, how has it evolved since then into, you know, post-1947 and then moving in the subsequent decades till today? I think we need to first also look at how it was during uh, before partition. Sure. That was the more important era uh, where, I mean, we must acknowledge and remember the fact that uh, uh, the Indian subcontinent was vivisected on the basis of religion. Uh, it, there, there is no two ways about that. Um, that, you know, the communal considerations is what led to a split of the entire subcontinent. So in such a context, what did the, the majority religion do when their land was actually divided in, and parceled off into uh, portions on different sides of uh, itself? Uh, and so the, the uh, Hindutva, as I said earlier, uh, which I see as Hinduism that resists, Hinduism that puts forth uh, that uh, opposition, um, was, I think, um, you know, uh, given its full strength and teeth initially by Savarkar, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. And in fact, from my book, I'd actually like to read one portion which kind of encapsulates this very well uh, of the times. There's this, in 1925, he has a dialogue with um, uh, Maulana Shaukat Ali, who was one of the leaders of the Khilafat movement, uh, working closely with Mahatma Gandhi then. And the two of them meet in Bombay and Shaukat Ali urges uh, Savarkar and the, uh, and his Hindu uh, you know movement to relinquish all these attempts of coming together uh, and also the Shuddhi or the reconversion that was being planned for people who had left the Hindu fold. Now, being a non-proselytizing religion, if somebody left the Hindu fold either due to allurements or under coercion, there was no mechanism to bring them back into the uh, Hindu fold. Uh, so the Arya Samaj and Swami Dayan and Saraswati started the whole Shuddhi movement where you could reconvert back to Hinduism and Savarkar, the Hindu Mahasabha, uh, made it a very important part of their agenda as well. And Shaukat Ali has this dialogue with him saying, can you give this up? Because I think this um, you know, spoils uh, the uh, unity between the two communities and creates a lot of, uh, you know, um, fissures between us and national unity is actually harmed. To, uh, to that, Savarkar replies, and I quote him, if a religion as tolerant and peace-loving as Hinduism that never proselytized anyone forcibly and even forgave or forgot the coercive and violent attempts made on its faith has to today take the help of Shuddhi, where should the blame lie? on the victim or on the aggressor. Till date, we trusted people and kept the doors of our houses open. Thieves from across the world came in and looted our possessions. Today, we have gathered some sense, become alert, and we have decided to keep our doors locked. And if the same decoits now come to us and tell us, we have been looting you for so long, putting a lock on your doors is being unfair to us, and this will spoil relationships between us, what are we to reply? Such a lethal unity is best broken in my view. He also goes on to say, and I quote him, and the, the, the term for Hindutva before it actually uh, you know, came into existence was Sangathan movement. Sangathan as the uh, Hindi Sanskrit word meant consolidation, coming together. Uh, just as the HAF is a federation which has come together of people with similar interests. So the Hindu Sangathan movement is what it was initially conceptualized as. And he says this again, and I quote him, as long as the Hindu Sangathan movement is not violent, not aggressive, not usurping of your rights, your property or your life, and as long as it stands for truth and self-protection, why should anyone have a grouse with it? As long as all these communal movements and the missions of Aga Khan, Hassan Nizami or the Khilafat carry on, as long as thousands of Hindus are forcibly converted and coerced, as long as Hin Urdu newspapers openly proclaim the agenda to mass convert Hindus in the next five to 10 years, advising us Hindus to give up any attempts to organize and protect ourselves for the sake of some mirage that you call as national unity is utter hypocrisy. 
unquote. So I think this sets the tone as, as to what were the tensions that were prevailing then, uh, you know, and particularly in the wake of, as I said, secessionist forces, the partition of the country, uh, it was progressing towards that very thing. Two things that were happening. One was, as I said, consolidation and putting up of resistance. The other important part, Samirji, which we don't address and which we normally ignore is modernism uh, and social reform. Now, it's, it's a corollary of the fact that you need to be united and consolidate. For that, you need to cleanse your group of any ills that you have. Only then can people come together. So Hindu society and no qualms in accepting that as well, that it was ridden with all kinds of factions and uh, you know uh, evils of the caste system, untouchability and so on. So one of the important uh, parameters that all most all the Hindutva leadership uh, always spoke about was a casteless society uh, to purge the Hindu society of these fissures, which kept them divided because it was antithetical to the interests of the Hindutva movement itself. If there were so many castes, if you gave up those and came together, only then Sangathan or consolidation could happen. But unfortunately, I think uh, people across the world, including you know Western academics, particularly in the US, they just do not understand this fact. And they call Hindutva as being caste and Brahminical patri mm -hmm. patriarchy and all those uh, silly terms, uh, not realizing that it would be suicidal for the Hindutva movement itself to actually encourage caste because in which case you would have multiple units. The, their whole idea was to unite this group. So the natural corollary is you ask your adherents to give up all these uh, you know, divisions amongst yourselves. So uh, casteless society is something that uh, Hindutva advocated right from the kind of work that Savarkar did for almost 13 years, uh, from 1924 to 1937 uh, in Ratnagiri in Maharashtra, where he spoke of a complete dismantling of the Varanashrama system, the caste system, uh, from the very roots, not just abolition of untouchability, but a removal of all caste identities, uh, entry of people uh, of all communities to temples, uh, access to uh, you know, public services, be it public transport, schools, uh, you know, communal festivals, be it uh, you know, Ganesh, Chaturthi and other things which were uh, very popular in Maharashtra, where people of all communities could actually participate together. In fact, Savarkar started uh, the first ever temple uh, in 1931 called the Patit Pavan Mandir, uh, where people of all castes, all communities could actually enter and the person from the lowest strata in the Hindu caste hierarchy was the priest. So even the Brahmin had to go and take, uh, uh, you know, pay obeisance to this person and, uh, you know, get uh, blessings. And this continued even afterwards, Samirji, I mean, post-independence too. Interestingly, uh, it was in 1964 when the Vishwa Hindu Parishad was formed at the Kumbh Mela in Prayag. And what surprised most people, uh, you know, was that almost every sect, community, the Mathas and Jain seers, Buddhist monks, Sikh uh, gurus, all of them were there on a single platform, probably for the first time in the 5000 years of documented history of the Hindu civilization. And during that, uh, Golwalkar, who was the head of the RSS, uh, one of his biggest achievements was to persuade that entire gathering of so many religious heads to completely disown the Varnashrama and the caste system and passed a resolution which said, Hindavaha sahodaraha na Hindu patito bhavet. All Hindus are born out of the same womb of Mother India. Therefore, they're all brothers and sisters and no Hindu can be treated as untouchable. Uh, so this was probably one of the biggest, you know, reform, social reform pushes that anyone could uh, have given. And very interestingly, you had all the, you know, Shankaracharyas and others who were a part of that group who did believe in the caste system and so on. Even they had to, uh, you know, um, be a part of this conference and sign up to this resolution that all Hindus are one. So the, the, where is this whole question of uh, Brahminical hegemony and uh, all kinds of things? I think it's either very badly informed criticism or deliberate, uh, you know, malicious propaganda that is usually done against the proponents of Hindutva. 
Uh, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, propaganda there. So I, I, that's a nice uh, kind of tie in for my next question, that there is a claim uh, that Hindutva is actually inspired by an outgrowth of European fascism, or more specifically, Nazism. Uh, you know, how would you address that claim? Or what is the basis of that claim? Where is that coming from? <laughs> so, <laughs> I think this is also, I mean, it's, 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 a, as you rightly said, it is propaganda, uh, but one thing must be acknowledged and I've done that in fact, even in my book that, uh, you know, the, the, while the leaders were in this whole quest for uh, liberation of the country, they were, they were being inspired by different uh, ideologies and people from other parts of the world. Uh, so the Italian revolutionaries, uh, the Italian movements were something that did uh, inspire several people in India, uh, particularly the revolutionary movement in India. And the Hindu Mahasabha, many of its leaders, uh, like Dr. Munje, uh, you know, he was a part of the roundtable conference that was held in uh, London in the 1930s uh, to discuss the new constitution for free India. And during that uh, visit, he did take a detour, go to Italy. He met Mussolini, um, and uh, you know Mussolini's, uh, you know the the youth corps and the, the the scouts and guides and all of that that he had uh, developed for the fascist movement in Italy was something that inspired uh, him to the extent that we need to have a body like this of young people who are armed, who can protect themselves, and who can also take on colonial uh, superpower. So to that extent, the, 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 the military uh, you know, mobilization and the weaponization of, uh, of people, to that extent, I can say that in those early years, now we're talking of the early 1930s, when the horrors of uh, the Holocaust or the World War had not yet broken out, so at that time, there were a lot of people who were inspired by this new zeal that was emerging in Europe against, uh, you know, British imperialism, and uh, they were seen as the underdogs, and a cause which was very common to what was happening in India as well, uh, where we were fighting against the same kind of colonial domination. So to that extent, they were the, the militarization of their groups, of their people, for legitimate causes of anti-colonial struggle. That was something that... I would concede that there was a lot of, uh, you know, initial inspiration that was drawn. And Munje, when he came back, he tried to impose the same kind of, uh, you know, regimen on the RSS. Uh, but there was a lot of, uh, you know, clash between the two organizations, the Hindu Mahasabha, which was a political front, and the RSS, which was fashioning itself as a, a social, cultural organization which was not looking at politics at all and so that's why this clash saying uh, the rss was against this whole weaponization of their members so the, uh, that again is another propaganda item where we do not accept uh, the plurality of schools of thought within the hindutva rubric as well you had the hindutva philosophy uh, prop uh, propagated by the mahasabha which was a out and out political organization, very different from what the RSS spoke uh, about, uh, you know, Hindutva. And there were other militant kind of organizations too, uh, you know, uh, the, the Hindu Yuva Vahini and so many other groups which were there at that time, which were talking about uh, these kind of, uh, you know, um, um, a militant assertion of their identity. So there is a multiplicity and to brush all of them under one, uh, paint. I think that is very, very erroneous. So I do not subscribe to this view that Hindutva as a whole was in, uh, inspired by fascism. Because as I said, the, the very germination of these terms, these ideas came about in the 1880s, 1890s. And the early history, Samirji, of the, even the revolutionary movement, if you see the rich, uh, you know, allegories of Hindu nationalism and, uh, uh, you know, the, the appropriation of iconographies of gods, goddesses, particularly the goddess, uh, you know, whether it is Chandi, whether it is Durga, the Bhavani in Bengal, Maharashtra, in Punjab, these were very potent symbols, uh, you know, Sri Aurobindo called India as Bhavani Bharati, uh, you know, and uh, Bankim Chandra coming up with the Anand Mat and the uh, war cry of Bande Mataram, where the motherland, it was called, it was seen as a divine feminine iconography. Uh, these were all richly drawn from the Sanatan Dharma traditions. So that was also Hindu nationalism. Uh, in fact, during my research in uh, the British library, I came across these proscribed 
you know, literature of the revolutionary movement. And there was this very fascinating, you know, posters that were apparently very popular those days, where Bhagat Singh, Sukhdev, Rajguru, the other famous revolutionaries of uh, the Indian freedom struggle, they are all shown as if, you know, they're chopping off their own heads and giving it as an offering to Bharat Mata, who's standing there smiling at all of them and very uh, pleasantly accepting this offering from uh, her brave sons. Uh, so this iconography was so powerful. So in today's uh, India and today's world, which is so weaponized against Hindutva, someone would see this poster and call it as a communal, uh, you know, uh, poster, which is Hindu supremacist. So, but then that is not the case. So a large part of our freedom movement too drew immensely from Hindu iconography. Uh, and we've been ashamed to own that up for so long, uh, only in the false mirage that it's going to, you know, upset the apple cart of today's society and communities and so on. But then this is a fact of, uh, you know, Vande Mataram itself, as I mentioned, the very uh, invocation of your country as a mother, uh, all of that drew itself from uh, traditional Sanatana Dharma, uh, you know, um, thoughts, and they were not rooted in some fascist ideology sitting somewhere in Italy, the or or Germany or wherever else. So the, their inspiration was limited to the point of how do you organize yourself militarily? How do you do all these uh, physical exercises, marches, uh, and uh, militarize yourself in to protect yourself against the eventuality of partition, which was staring in the face of everyone, and a civil war that was to follow after that, where the Hindus would be in a huge disadvantage, considering that they had been emasculated over you know, decades of ahimsa and non-violence and so on. So to that extent, it was inspired, but the rest of it, I would consider it completely homegrown, based on uh, the foundational principles of our own Sanatan Dharma. You alluded to some of the academic criticism of Hindutva and the weaponization of it. You know, over the years, what was the response by the governments at the time or administrations at the time, whether it was the British colonial administration or over the years, you know, the independent Indian government uh, um, administration, as well as other segments of society? So non from the non Hindu uh, society, how do they view it? How do they respond to it? If you could talk a little bit about both the government and the non state societal responses and views of Hindutva over the years. Well, uh, the colonial government was obviously, uh, you know, against uh, any kind of consolidation and uh, grouping of people, particularly the vast majority. Uh, the very fact that the British survived for two centuries in this subcontinent was on the uh, ideals of divide and rule. Uh, they couldn't obviously, uh, you know, uh, accept or uh, promote any kind of consolidation among its people. Uh, so that part of course it was it was a tough struggle for uh, many of the uh, the the proponents of hindutva pre independence uh, but even then i mean this whole idea as i mentioned briefly of militarization that was that is also something that is held against several of the hindutva uh, you know leadership whether it was munje whether it was savarkar the mahasabha and so on that they collaborated with the british and actually uh, sent a lot of hindus to the british uh, army uh, so to say but there was a there was a deeper strategic reason for that that as i said since most indians did not have access to weapons and arms uh, as per the british acts so most of them had no training in uh, warfare secondly you know this whole this vast movement of nonviolence uh, had almost made people give up any attempts to resist uh, legitimately also everything was thought of only through the tools of satyagraha and so on that you could achieve what you wanted uh, but at the same time you had a group which was trying to uh, about 60 percent of the british indian army uh, just at the onset of the second world war was composed of muslims and someone like dr ambedkar had flagged this off as a big uh, you know security threat to the country saying what happens if a co-religionist say from afghanistan or so on uh, attacks the borders. Will the Muslim soldier, and this is something Ambedkar is talking about and not me, uh, that what will the Muslim soldier's allegiance be towards his core religionist or will it be towards the land of his origin? So uh, this is a, a security threat that you need to wake up to. So in the wake of all of this, there was this need to also 
train yourself in the warfare. Uh, so enter the British Army, train yourself, and then actually defect to Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose's Indian National Army, which was being formed there, uh, to fight for uh, the country's freedom. And also the second reason is to protect your legitimate rights in the wake or the uh, you know eventuality that was staring in the face of a bloodbath, a civil war, and a partition uh, of the subcontinent. But post-independence, uh, particularly the Nehruvian era, you, uh, I think the, the whole fascination of Nehru of wanting a rupture from the past and wanting to build a new India, modern India, uh, which does not have, uh, you know, uh, too much of an allegiance to these elements of the past also led him to, and did also just come out of, uh, you know, the bloody partition. Uh, communities had to be healed, uh, so to, to, to secularize, to bring people together. Uh, the albatross of all of that was put on the Hindu shoulders, saying you're the bigger brother, so you need to give in concessions, you need to uh, be a little more generous, you need to get uh, everyone together, and probably that era it also worked. But over decades after independence, uh, this accommodative spirit uh, of coexistence, tolerance, uh, for the sake of national unity and social cohesion, somehow gave way to the perversion of uh, appeasement politics and minority appeasement, uh, most of the time at the cost of, uh, you know, the majority community. For instance, in India, uh, it's only the, the Hindu community whose uh, temples and institutions are controlled by the government. And all the the, the proceeds from the Hindu institutions go into the government coffers and they could use it to build anything from a highway to a, a school somewhere, they could do what they pleased. Whereas minority institutions are exempt from any kind of government interference. Vast tracts of land are part of either the, 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 the Church of South India, the Church of North India, the Vakf Board and so on, with zero kind of uh, you know, um, uh, surveillance or in, uh, interference from anybody. So in, from what logic can that be called secularism, where actually the majority community is penalized for being more in number. Uh, so there, there needs to be equal rules for everybody. So uh, I think a lot of these detrimental, this is just one example, there are multiple, uh, multiple of such examples, which have perverted secularism as it progressed uh, in independent India. And that has led to a backlash now. Uh, we are seeing Hindutva maybe 3.0. <laughs> if Hindutva 1.0 was the early, uh, you know, the Chandranath Basu and the Aurobindo era, 2.0 being the Savarkar era, the 3.0 now is where a lot of common Hindus are getting, are seeing all of this. They are getting aware of the kind of uh, prejudices, the kind of uh, discrimination that's happening. Uh, some part is discrimination, a lot of it is stereotyping in popular culture, in academia, in media, you know, uh, there's a currently a huge rage in India of against Bollywood, uh, the Hindi film industry, which for the longest time has used very subtle messaging against the Hindus, against the Hindu traditions, against Hindu gods, as if mocking them, uh, is so passe, whereas, uh, you know, you couldn't dare to do that uh, against any other community. So I think a lot of common Indians outside the fold of politics, outside the fold of political organizations or so on, they're now getting this awareness that, you know, thus far and no further. Uh, you know, there's this wonderful anecdote, Samirji, which uh, is attributed to Swami Vivekananda, uh, where he was traveling, I think, to the U.S. for um, for his uh, the, the speech at the Parliament of Religions in Chicago, and either on his way back or uh, to, on his way to the U.S. it uh, skips my mind. But he's sitting at, at the deck of the ship, and there's this pastor missionary uh, person who is spewing venom on uh, on the Hindu faith and to someone else. And for the longest time, Vivekananda is listening to all of this. Uh, and at some point, he's so enraged that he leaps at him, holds him by the collar and says, if you speak one more word against my religion, I'm going to throw you off into the ocean. So I think that was Hindutva in action, where, uh, you know, we will listen to you, uh, but there is going to be a threshold level, mm. that there will be a point of thus far and no further, that, and that is... Uh, you know, legitimate resistance of any social, cultural, religious group 
to safeguard its own identity and to ensure its uh, perpetuity and existence. So that is how I have, I would see the evolution of uh, you know Hindutva, especially post independence and in the decades closer to the times that we are in now. Hmm. And you know, you touched on something with your example of secularism in India and the control of Hindu institutions, but no other. And as a lawyer, I've always found that mind boggling, um, how you can have a separate, really a separate set of laws that only apply to one religion versus another as a as opposed to a neutral set of laws that applies to everybody equally. So I think that's a that's a great example of, of one of the problems and how people have you know, seen that as problematic, and it's led to a lot of that resistance. You know, one thing I wanted to touch on in terms of the study of um, Hindutva, you have done extensive research in your biographies on Savarkar, and you uh, talked about him from a very objective manner, as well as Hindutva. Um, and what you find, though, is that you don't normally see that objectivity. There's a difficulty in analyzing these types of figures from the past, as well as ideologies like Hindutva from an objective manner. Why do you think it's so hard for people to actually, you know, look at the facts and, you know, analyze it according to that, as opposed to trying to color it with their own interpretations or their own agendas? <laughs> well, uh, I think, you know, that's a, that's a very interesting question. And I, I think it begs a deeper investigation as to why this is happening. Maybe, you know, the very fact that we are the only surviving quote-unquote pagan civilization, uh, while most of the uh, uh, other idolaters, uh, polytheists and others have been crushed, whether it's in other parts of Asia or Africa and, uh, you know, South America and so on, uh, that fact uh, doesn't sit well in the eyes of a lot of uh, pro-colonialists uh, and, uh, you know, Eurocentric colonialism. Um, so I would see number of factors, you know, some are very ideological, uh, you know, which come from, again, this Eurocentric, uh, you know, colonialism. A lot of it is uh, racist. Uh, it's also, uh, you know, comes against the very idea of, um, you know, uh, the people did not want India to succeed, even when it was formed. There were always obituary columns written about India would collapse as a country because, uh, you know, we, uh, we, are, we are just so um, there's multiplicity in everything that we have. There's no anchoring central unit. Uh, and while it has been true in the, it's quite, uh, you know, uh, ironical that those countries in our vicinity, in our neighborhood, which were unitary in terms of religion or whatever, they are in the mess that they are, whether it's Pakistan or Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and all of that. And pa Bangladesh breaking out from Sri Lanka, uh, Pakistan. If religion was the glue, then ideally they should have stuck on. But the very fact that India has survived uh, all these decades and it's a thriving democracy. Uh, today, we are also an economic superpower. We've surpassed uh, UK too as the fifth largest uh, economy. All of that doesn't sit too well in the eyes of the larger uh, you know, anti-India forces. And uh, along with that, I think, particularly in academia, the Marxist ideology, uh, which uh, kind of uh, colors all kind of discourse uh, and modernity as it is seen in the Western context, that is one thing. And I think the uh, a, another part of this discrimination or this inability to objectively view uh, ideologies or people associated with it, which don't sit with their larger worldview is uh, theological. Because as I said right at the beginning, we are dealing with uh, theologies which do not uh, seek, uh, you know, embrasive inclusiveness at all. And that elephant in the room is often never addressed, but it is to be looked, you know, straight into the eye and address that, uh, you know, you, you are dealing with uh, faiths and religions which do not accommodate, which uh, say that there is only one way, uh, my way or the highway. And so in the wake of that, this objectivity really uh, is thrown out of the window and everything you're, you know, you're creating a straw man uh, and sweeping generalizations have to be made and stereotypes have to be built. And these over time need to be reinforced and some stray incident here and there in a vast country like India, you would have some, uh, you know, uh, incidents happening somewhere in, 
in, in such a big country. To ju juxtapose that and stereotype it and make a theory out of it, uh, I think that becomes a very uh, you know, well-oiled agenda, which is what is happening, uh, unfortunately, uh, over several decades now. So you were talking about the lack of objectivity from others, but how did you get um, interested in your exploration of Savarkar and your objective analysis? And I would highly recommend everyone read the two um, part uh, uh, series on it. Um, it is fantastic. It is comprehensive. Um, and again, objective. Um, you read it. You wrote it as he was, not as you would like to present him or would like him to be understood. Uh, so, what led you to down that road and kind of sparked your interest in studying him more? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Samirji, for the kind words. Uh, I think you know. I mean, Savarkar was. I mean, despite being such an important figure in Indian history, he didn't feature in the textbooks. Uh, of Indian history uh, that at least I, uh, you know, studied while growing up. And it was only much later and from the 90, uh, late 1990s, especially with uh, political parties, which allegedly, uh, you know, swore an, uh, you know, um, uh, allegiance to Hindutva, the, the BJP in particular, uh, coming to positions of power in different parts of India, including the central government under Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee initially uh, brought Hindutva and the debate around it into center stage focus. Uh, and if one had to study about this and more so about the life of the uh, you know, person who actually uh, postulated this as a modern theory, uh, there was hardly any, and it's, it's alarming uh, and also amazing that the severe lack of academic uh, interest in a subject and a person like this to actually scrutinize what he said and what he wrote, what was the context in which this uh, philosophy came up and what were the repercussions for India. So none of this was being done. It was again being done with the same, you know, creating a straw man and stereotyping of him by vested interests and, uh, you know, uh, name them the Marxist historians who wrote a little bit about uh, some of uh, some of whatever he had written, and uh, uh, also he wrote prolifically in Marathi, a language that probably was seldom accessed by several of these so-called mainstream academics and historians. And so I thought, you know, closer as this debate was getting fe a feverish pitch, and Savarkar makes an intrusion into contemporary Indian politics like few other uh, you know figures of the past do where you know election manifestos are woven around his name uh, whether he'll get the bharat ratna or not and uh, you know um, there's somebody who's defaming him someone who's calling him names and you have the prime minister actually going to uh, the cellular jail where he was incarcerated in the andamans and paying his obeisances so to a young in indian mind or anyone outside india uh, saying, what is this fuss all about? Who is this man? What what was his uh, life and role? Uh, there was no biography written on him for the longest time. The, the last biography comprehensively written, at least in English, was in the 1960s by this man called Dhananjay Kir. Uh, and that was more of a hagiographical account because he was an acolyte of Savarkar. Uh, but after that, uh, for so many decades, Somebody whose philosophy was on the political ascendant in India, somebody who was constantly being spoken about, there was such a lack of interest in investigating his uh, writings, his life, and so on. So again, Tony Morrison came into picture uh, of wanting to, uh, you know, <laughs> you, you know, write the book that you want to read if it's not been written yet. And so that's how I embarked on this journey. It took me almost five to six years to ferret out a lot of information uh, from various archives, from various sources to put together this account. And uh, I mean, for those who've read it, um, would know that. I have not tried to lionize him. Uh, I've alluded to several of his uh, shortcomings, which he would have if he were human and not a, a god or something. Uh, so uh, I've been very unabashedly talking about all of that, his uh, failings and his, uh, you know, plus points like any good leader would have. So I think there's a need to have more such uh, conversations as well as you know, academic content, scholarly content on uh, people and uh, ideologies which go beyond the mainstream as it is uh, based today. Right. And speaking of conversations, um, I think we're almost at the one year anniversary. We are at the one year anniversary of the infamous uh, dismantling global Hindutva 
conference uh, that was sponsored by academics across American universities in 2021. Uh, and that conference, its whole goal ostensibly was to dismantle global Hindutva. Um, it was seen as Hinduphobic, anti-Hindu. On the flip side, it did foster a lot of global debate on the subject. It uh, increased uh, a lot of awareness ar around the topic. How do you view that conference, um, seeing that you are a historian you've written extensively on these subjects? How did you view that conference when it happened and the aftermath of it? Hmm. Yeah, as you rightly said, I think it was it was more of a propaganda than an academic conference. Uh, first of all, any academic conference, there's a formal call of call for papers. Uh, there's a there's uh, you know you invite multiple viewpoints. You have varied uh, opinions coming on board and talking about uh, any any subject or any theme for a conference. I don't remember this particular conference having any invitation for call for papers uh, for uh, for the conference at all. So it was a clique, a group of people whose agenda, whose uh, political leanings and whose maliciousness is known uh, to people all over. Uh, and the the they they just coming together and forming this cozy coalition also with some of their cohorts who are in India, who are only all the time very, very willing to sell their souls to be part of any such, uh, you know, global coalition which talks against Hindus or against India. Um, and we all remember the the the, the the fraud that came to the uh, you know for when the logos of various universities mm -hmm. uh, which had been appropriated by the so-called uh, uh, academics and scholars uh, who are more of activists rather than academics um, you know uh, when that blew in their face where most of those universities went back and said we never sponsored this uh, uh, this particular thing so uh, it was I think for the first time, the the enemy literally grouping itself into a large uh, coalition and hitting you straight in the face a lot of these uh, nefarious things were happening underground but this was i think the first in your face attack uh, what was uh, interesting for me to notice was that the government of india or even uh, in fact the rss uh, in fact the 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 lo the conference logo if i remember was from a hammer or something you were actually yeah plucking out these RSS Swayam Sevaks, uh, you know, allegedly because of their attire, uh, one could uh, allude to them. The RSS also was curiously silent about it. The Indian government did not do much about it. But I think the outrage was largely uh, spurred by common Indians and common Hindus, whether they were in India or the diaspora, like all of you. And this, for the first time, I think a lot of this is one more element of, I think, Hindu history uh, and Indian history that till the enemy is at your gates, you never unite. <laughs> till then you're fighting, <laughs> you're fighting, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, multiple battles within yourself. Once somebody strikes you right there uh, and is there right at the gate, then suddenly uh, in a huddle, you you kind of come together. So the 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 good fallout of this uh, was, I think, twofold. One is it brought together people. It created this awareness that hey, look, there is this whole group which is talking about that uh, about such things. And then this this whole fleshing out of uh, academic and scholarly content of what Hindu phobia is, uh, which I think uh, you know people like uh, Dr. Indu uh, Vishwanathan and Parth Parihar and and endorsed by. Uh, you know, the HAF and other organizations. Uh, and recently, more recently, the Rutgers University doing this whole study on, uh, you know, the Hindu phobia, which is on the rise and what are those actual, you know, data points around it. All these has, has come out as an, uh, uh, you know, unintended outcome of that, uh, you know, uh, sham of a conference for which we should thank them uh, for helping us unite. Uh, it also exposed for the first time who are, the people who are involved in this, um, in, because if you remember, it, I think over two or three days is what that conference went on for. On the first day, everyone was saying Hindutva is different, Hinduism is different. We are talking of dismantling Hindutva. By the end of the third day, they had all converged to this view that 
there can be no hindutva until there is hinduism so hinduism itself needs to be dismantled yeah, yeah. so we actually the intent of this nefarious group was out in the open and out for the public to uh, see and so to that extent mm-hmm. i think they've spurred so much of uh, uh, unity so many other initiatives on our side of the spectrum which is good i think the um, uh, the hindu month or so of heritage and so on in october right which uh, which uh, some of the us states came out with probably that also came out because of this increasing uh, you know under siege that very peaceful minority a prosperous minority uh, of uh, the us uh, you know was being subjected to and uh, i think that was a good outcome to that extent we need to thank them i think they need to keep doing many more conferences <laughs> like and i hope they do it uh, so that we continue to uh, regroup in a better fashion and bring out more literature against them uh, which uh, which which will ensure that their designs are caught right uh, in the beginning no absolutely and i think it was a galvanizing moment in history for especially for the hindu american community i know global outrage was there for hindus in india and everywhere around the world but particularly because it was hosted in america many groups like hf and other organizations across the spectrum activists just community members alike i think really came together and uh, led many campaigns and efforts uh, to shed light on the hindu phobic nature of that conference and um, you mentioned the the wonderful rutgers report um, and a lot of that is manifesting in terms of you know we've seen very tragic hindu phobic incidents hate crimes that have been occurring recently and a lot of the same slurs a lot of the same depictions or views on hindus and stereotypes have come out in these hate crimes where uh, Hindu Americans have been assaulted or Hindu Mandirs have been, you know, attacked and the slurs have accompanied them. And you see in Fremont, where I live in the Bay Area in California, Hindu man was called a cow piss drinker and all these other, you know, slurs about being a dirty Hindu. This is the rhetoric that we see coming from those same forces um, and the academic or activist realm um, at the DGHs and other places. And this is what we see as the ramifications of that is that it actually leads to real world consequences against uh, the Hindu community, uh, whether in America or, you know, other parts of the world. Um, so, you know, it's I think it's it's a it's a double edged sword. It's obviously, um, you know, horrible when these types of things happen, but again, does galvanize the community, hopefully brings more action um, to the fore. I want to end our conversation. I wish we had more time. Um, would love to talk to you for another two, three hours. Um, you have so much knowledge and so much um, historical perspective, but let's look a little bit to the future. Um, you've talked a little bit about the history evolution of Hindutva kind of it's how that philosophy was on the ascendancy in um, the early 2000s and going forward. Where do you see the future of Hindutva going, um, particularly in India, but maybe even on the global scale, you know, today we're in 2022, but going forward in the next decade or so? Well, uh, being a historian who looks only to the past, it's (laughs) tough to be a a crystal ball gazer to look at the future. (laughs) But I think, uh, you know, with time and i think uh, with with india's emergence uh, as a as an economic power and as a military power and so on the world finally bows to only these two things uh, whether it's your economic might or your military might uh, you know and that is recognized worldwide now as india starts to grow more and more on these aspects and also rectify some of its internal uh, you know uh, problems so on the social uh, front and so on uh, it will be a voice that will be very tough to uh, neglect uh, or to undermine in the manner that uh, you know uh, the world does why doesn't the world talk about uh, china why isn't there uh, you know uh, what the uyghur muslims are facing in china even china's a- a- ally pakistan is not able to talk about it let alone the us or uh, you know all these academics should organize a conference on the uh, islamophobia in china but why don't they ever dare to do that because of uh, china's both soft power as well as uh, you know hard power in terms of uh, military might economic uh, advantages that it has as, uh, considering india is headed that way i think these uh, representations and portrayals of um, uh, India and Hindutva and Hinduism um, would also, in my view, perhaps, and hopefully so, uh, start coming down. 
and i would see, see uh, you know even to this date uh, hindutva even the, the way it manifests itself in india is still in the fashion of the pre independent era where it is very reactive it is very defensive uh, where it's constantly you know uh, on the guard and on um, fights and causes and the sometimes imagined sometimes real enemies uh, you know which which are being uh, constantly being there to fight against um, at some point uh, you know i would see or I also hope that there is a more self assured and confident hindutva which is also aware of its civilizational greatness uh, what it brings to the committee of nations and to uh, you know human knowledge universal human knowledge in the 5000 6000 years of its existence and as the only you know pre bronze age civilization that is still around uh, we need to bring that uh that that self confidence uh into our narrative into our discourse and not all the time be reactive and defensive i would see that also as being maybe uh, you know an um, a consequence of political military economic might which in uh, times to come would lead to a more uh, you're not all the time having discussions like this where we are we are we are the victims we would talk about ourselves our past our faith our uh, civilization our history with a little, with a lot more confidence with a lot more uh, you know um, uh, mojo and courage and i think that is what is the way forward and that i don't see that not happening uh, maybe it may take some time but hopefully in the next 3 4 decades that's how i see uh, this evolving if i have crystal ball, ball gazed uh, that is that's pretty good crystal balling yeah, so that's if we are around for another 3 4 decades <laughs> we'll probably pro uh, verify and go back to this recording and yeah. say uh, was i right or wrong <laughs> we'll hold you to account if you were wrong that's for sure yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think on that positive note, that's a good place for us to wrap up our, our conversation today. Uh, Vikram ji, a wonderful uh, conversation. Really enjoyed you taking the time to be with us today and get, for giving your insight on this uh, very complicated um, and very misunderstood topic. And it was a pleasure and look forward to having many more conversations in the future. Namaste. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste.